here it's a rainy day also more Vermonters will probably get on <laughs> and the start of deer hunting season so no one wants to be out in the woods today <laughs> Rebecca, I don't know if you know that I'm in Vermont. I mean, yeah, I'm in Vermont. I'm in Maine now. Oh, you are. You moved. Yeah. Oh. Yes. It's right before awesome. COVID. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Over here in California, it's it's been pretty nice. We got some rain actually last week. A, a good solid amount of rain for us a few days, which was really good. We needed it. Um, but yeah, now it's almost like we're back to um, summer over here. So don't mean to brag or anything. <laughs> <laughs> it was cold and rainy in Pennsylvania, but now the sun is out, but it's still pretty chilly. You guys have all those beautiful colors over there. Yeah, they're not gonna last much longer though. <sighs> yeah. They run keeper tours here, you know, put people on buses, tourists to go see the foliage as it moves south. Oh, I see Meredith Bergman. Hi, Meredith. Can you hear me? Hi, hi, Lynn. Yes, but I was muted. Hi, yeah. how are you? It's so nice I'm to see your fine. face. Wonderful to see one you. One of the great, one of the great things about Zoom is that I get to see people Does everybody <laughs> that I Meredith? would otherwise not. She's a... Uh, an extremely talented sculptor who's got work everywhere. Thank you. I'm I'm just a, I'm gonna I'm working on a, a model of a giant bronze screen. So I have to spend the afternoon cutting out foam core. So at some point I'm gonna turn off the video and just listen. All right. Pretty good. Well, why don't we begin then? Um, welcome everyone this afternoon um, to this afternoon's Able Muse reading. I'm Deirdre O'Connor, and as your host, I'm delighted to be introducing two Able Muse poets, Rebecca Starks and Len Kresak. First, I'd like to thank Karina Fernandez and Alexander Peppel for all the work they did in organizing this reading. And before he shares a few words of welcome with us, I'd like to introduce Alex Peppel. Alex founded and edits Able Muse and Able Muse Press, and also founded and directs the Eratosphere Online Workshop. His poetry and prose have been or will be published in Barrow Street, River Sticks, American Arts Quarterly, Light, Think Journal, Euphony, Per Contra, Eclectica, Measure, and elsewhere. He edited the Able Muse anthology uh, which was published in 2010. Uh, welcome, Alex. Well, thank you very much, Deirdre. And thank you all for being here uh, this afternoon. I will look, I'm looking forward to reading by two uh, very talented poets, uh, Rebecca and Len, who will be entertaining us this uh, afternoon. And uh, I'm glad to see you all at another Able Muse reading. And, before I hand it over to Deirdre, I'd like to do something uh, unusual now, uh, because we have one of our colleagues and friends, uh, Susan DeSola, who passed away uh, at the end of last month. And I'm sure most of you are very familiar with her. As she, she was also one of the featured readers uh, towards the end of last year at Able News, uh, at one of our reading here. So if, uh, I would like your indulgence in reading one of our poems before we start. And uh, so uh, it turns out uh, she has a carnation. I'm sorry, Lily is her favorite flower. And so I'll read a, an ekphrastic poem of hers, which uh, is uh, about a painting by the American artist uh, John Singer Sargent. And this is called Carnation Lily, Lily Rose. <clears throat> what have they caught? As if those Japanese lanterns glowing pink and teal were full of fireflies or glowworms. The girls' black boots and stockings tread on the uncut grasses and wildflowers 
and fortuitous lilies. They stir with sticks as if whirling fireflies to generate light. A small buzz of protest ricochets against the paper prison. Just two girls amid the profusion of fires and flowers, they are four feet, four hands in white butterfly casings. A girl myself, I stared long at this painting, trying to gather its meaning, its mystery, the mystery of its technology, the alluring toy they had. Now, if a sergeant, I'd prefer a grand dame, monumental, frontal, but here are his ladies in the make, ladies in the making, making the light, lighting up their faces, heads tilted down, absorbed, not yet inclined to let their faces take on the painter's paint. And very far away on a Japanese bay, a thousand lanterns rattle. The celebration unknown in England where girls toy with souvenirs hoping to coax fire from paper, heedless of lilies and carnations, while their black boots stamp down the garden grasses and blooms. And the white arms of the girls clasp white whole globes, spinning out the light. Thank you. And now I'll hand it over to Deirdre. Thank you so much, Alex. That was beautiful. Before I introduce our first reader, allow me to explain how our Zoom reading will work this afternoon. Rebecca will read first, followed by Len. And while the poets are reading, please make sure you have muted yourself so we hear only the readers. You are welcome to use emojis during the reading to signal a line or image or a poem that you appreciate. After both poets have read, We'll have an opportunity for Q&A. You're welcome to unmute yourself to ask a question or to put your questions in the chat and I will share them with the readers. And after the Q&A, we will have a final poem uh, from each of our readers to close the afternoon reading. Now to our first reader. Rebecca Starks is the author of the poetry collections Fetch Muse and Time is Always Now, both by Able Muse Press and the recipient of Rattle's Neil Postman Award for Metaphor and Poetry Northwest's Richard Hugo Prize. Her poems and short fiction have appeared in Valparaiso Review, Baltimore Review, Crab Orchard Review, Tahoma Literary, Literary Review, and elsewhere. She is the founding editor-in-chief of Mud Season Review and a board member of Sundog Poetry Center. She lives with her family and two adopted dogs in a log cabin in the woods of Richmond, Vermont, and works as a freelance workshop leader and writing consultant. Welcome, Rebecca. Thank you, Deirdre, and thank you, Alex. Um, and thank all of you for being here. It's so neat to see people from Albuquerque and uh, Kentucky and, of course, Vermont and elsewhere. Um, and just another thanks to Able Muse Press. It's been such an amazing experience working with uh, such a supportive and rigorous editor as Alex, who is, um, you know, when I look over my poems, I remember every line <laughs> that we've gone over almost. And it, it just, um, it's been a great learning experience. And um, so thank you for that. And I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Len Reed. It's, um, and Deirdre herself is a, is a wonderful poet. So it's been amazing to be part of that, um, published alongside people like that. I, um, well, I won't say much about each poem as I read because the context is, is included in the poems more than off, is often the case. The book itself is almost one long poem. It's a narrative um, that tells the story of adopting um, a dog with with um, unsuspected behavioral and medical problems. And um, it's sort of, so it's sort of a star-crossed love affair with this dog, but of course brings in um, other things. We adopted the dog about a year and a half before we got married and started a family. And, um, and we were pretty new to dog care. So it, it sort of a lot of things were in the mix and it ends up bringing in a lot of life. And so even if you don't, um, 
I think there's something in the book, even if you don't love dogs, <laughs> um, but it does help to have an experience of um, of bonding with animals and under you know realizing how deep those connections can go. And I've thought even as I've, I've worked on this book for about ten years intermittently, and over time I've sort of pulled in other. I've realized it's pulled in other relationships, loves and losses that I sort of read through the same metaphoric lens. So I'm hopeful that the book also can take on that resonance for other people. I'm going to put a look, a link in the Google in the chat. I did it. I put it earlier also, but it has the poems. Are going to, I'm going to read in case it's um, in case you like to look at poems while they're being read. Um, sometimes it's hard just to absorb them on first read, so you can click on that link and kind of scoot it to the side and look along as I'm reading, but don't get go ahead or whatever because it will kind of take away from the, the experience. Um, one note on form, uh, most of the poems are in unrhymed sonnets or mostly unrhymed. Um, I first wrote the book as a, the first draft was a full narrative like, uh, with just section uh, four, in 14 line seg segments that kind of, uh, there were maybe 250 of them and it was just, it just kept going. And then I decided to go back and sort of highlight some of those moments and really refine the sonnet form for them. But then I've connect, kept some narrative bridges kind of, um, so you'll see some things that aren't sonnets. Um, and the, you, the poems that are addressed to a you, that is the dog, but also the muse, um, the dog being the, connecting to the memories that I'm writing about. So with that, um, the first poem, the first poem shares a title with a dog's um, owner, dog owner's manual by Patricia McConnell. It's called The Other End of the Leash. When soon after we got the dog, we learned that she had a very disabling hip dysplasia and it was other dog owners at a park who let us know that's what it was. Um, so that's the back backdrop for the poem. The other end of the leash. The truth is I hate imposing constraint, strapping toddlers in car seats, forcing pills down a cat's throat, opening the bedroom door before a sleeper's breath has fully risen on anyone but myself. No longer free, I wanted you to fly, possessed by nothing but the bounding, boundless joy we'd nearly lost while we stood calcifying on the sidelines. So much for vicarious transcendence, that one last fling. You'd be instead a mirror of our hardships, evasions, and displacements. From then on, whenever we watched you run, all we could see was the pain, punishing, impersonal, you tried so hard to run from. The dog was also the beginning of the end of um, my telecommuting job. We had moved, um, we were in Portland, Oregon, during this time. And um, and I should say also the dog, some people like to know what kind of dogs things are. And she was six months old and was a Aust Aussie Shepherd Rottweiler mix. Um, just so you have that image of her. There's also the image of the cover on the cover, which is based on a photo of her. Default setting. Through months of rain, my job grew more remote. Contacts corroded, negotiations stalled in a backlog of futures, options, swaps. Your needs more pressing, psychic, uncompromising. Instead of pros and cons, I worked on you. Seize the squeak toy, nod it into the hamper, fetch it out, then dash to the ringing phone and lift it from the cradle. You'd sashay back, keeping just out of reach, refusing to drop before the dial tone. When Andy came home, I'd have you leap and give the door a shove with both front paws, then whirl back for applause. What couldn't I teach you but the sterner laws? What couldn't you learn when it was taught with love? Wasted wish. With time I've come to value the commands I never thought to give for things you did, <clears throat> excuse me, for things you did quite well, but never at the times we wanted. Relax for when I couldn't take you out right then or bark by which you'd come to know its quiet opposite. Stand to let a vet manipulate your hips and watch to hold the portal of your mind open to our cues. I learned from watching trainers at the zoo that what my dad forbade as tricks are tricks on those who don't suspect their purpose. 
shake no clowning circus act, but a faint letting a man draw a thorn from a lion's paw. When you limped, I wished I'd never taught you heal. So the book has three sections, um, dog, child, and muse, because I came to see those as the three threads or the three th commitments I kind of had to juggle and figure out um, how to stay true to um, as best I could at the time. And so this next several poems are from the middle section, child, um, and partly about the, they're about the radical adjustment of, um, of becoming a parent, or in my case, a mother. Misconception. From the moment I saw the double line, I was struck that I was body, a woman's, blind to how I identified his mind. Intent on choosing how it was occupied, slow to admit what doubt could not dislodge. Once I was pregnant, my mother thrilled to say, everything I did was full of purpose, eating, sleeping, nurturing the life within. I was too ashamed to say I'd felt that way about my mind, prepared to be a writer's, and now deprived of any other aim, but keeping off things that had no hope to change, only endure like a long illness, brooding on that which hadn't lived, yet might still die. One note on the next poem, um, the whole book I think is a little under the shadow of Milton's Paradise Lost. There is sort of um, echoes in the form for me originally. And, but I think of this next poem in particular as my childhood myth of what it means to be fallen and to have to, um, to think about your feelings and to justify, feel like you had to justify your feelings. Mortal taste. When she stopped eating, I brought her inside and holding her in my lap, read from the page where Hazel hops away from his still body. That's in Watership Down, if people don't know the book until she stretched out, breath ending in a rasp, and her litter mate prodded at the towel to bury her. I was aware of my mother in tears and my father turning away. Night after night, I cried behind my shut door until my father stopped me in the hallway, or was it out on the broken brick walk? The memory restores its surface tension both ways, but then he often repeated himself to tell me I wasn't crying about my rabbit, but about the time I missed spending with her. He taught me something I want to pass on. If you want to stop crying, don't think happy, think evil. The way when you taste something bitter, salt is a better antidote than sweet is. Now it's clearer to me. Upstairs, his mother was dying. Later that month, he would wake us and lead us to where she lay, her eyes part pearl. Each spring, I'd move my rabbits from the garage to an outdoor hutch where the breeze could reach them, ears and noses twitching, feet thumping alarm alert to a world where I read poems over one I couldn't taste, like the wild clover. The salt wheel rattled. When they shunned my hands, I stopped eating meat, their silence my conscience. Now it is clearer to me, I conflated my rabbit sentience with my own cosmic no. No, truer to say some people will always think of grief, think of it, the way lawyers think of trust, economists of generosity. Truer to say, attuned to her soul's wildness, mine had grown. I think of it now, reading of the children warehoused on the border, orphaned by law. What am I crying for? I've spent so little time thumping my foot on that cement floor, sick of the same stale food, looking at no windows, deciding how to use my one rough blanket. And when I stop, what taste has worked its cure? The next few poems um, give a sense of how our lives started to shrink with this dog and how the stakes got higher. Um, the, this poem has a, a spoiler alert that I reveal the dog's name, which I purposefully keep um, concealed until then. But um, the do we were sort of embarrassed by the dog's name that, we were, that she came with at the pound, but we couldn't come up with a new name before she, we had to put down an official name because she had to go to the vet for an emergency. Um, so um, here it is, voice control. Kismet indeed, I hear a woman snap after you've lunged full-throated at her, snapped back by the leash just in time. She'd come around a corner and surprise you more than me. By then I was all reflex, my mind numb, though the first time shocked me into acting, shocked to act, 
shocked to run up against my quickened fear of the fear I'd caught hints of, unarticulated low growls, but nothing so blatant as this disaster. Trotting ahead of me off leash along Lower Maclay in a blink you seized, hackles up, legs braced, barring the way barking and snarling at a man whose adrenaline rushed to rebuke. You have a vicious dog. I bristled at the gross exaggeration, hooked the leash on its ring, then apologized, in the Greek sense, defending the status quo, the state in which we now would find ourselves, shaken enough to keep you tied to me, or was it the reverse, myself to you? She just got scared. At which the man unleashed, berating me as I jogged on up the trail with lowered eyes until my heart could buoy and match our pace again. He just got scared. You came along calm until the next loose rock triggered another bull-throated barking fit. So that is how Kismet treats me in this country, the Turkish man on Belmont's, Belmont scathing, pissed, reminding us this Portland hippie name had deeper roots that tapped the will of Allah, how he divided lots. Friend, enemy, you divvied up the world so readily. You had defenders, dog people loved you, hands down, you were a real dog lover's dog. And you loved them back, sidled into them exuberant, lapping up the coos, a joy to those who could receive you in that light. This sharp-heeled woman wasn't one of them. Just watch him around the baby, her parting shot, as she appraised us coolly, our weak link. Surrogate. Midwinter saw a tug of war, my son pulling me into the womb he wouldn't leave. When we first came home, I had expected you to wonder at the miracle, me, baby. But after one sniff, you gave him a wide berth and lay sphinx pod back to the open doorway. Conscientious objector, seating your place, standing guard. I suspect you didn't know yourself what instinct had kicked in. And with it, latitude, ennui, you'd always known just what to do, not me. That other fall, the title of this one um, is from a Robert Frost poem. The oven bird, which you probably know from the last line, um, what to make of a diminished thing, but he refers to that other fall, we name the fall. What closeness we drew from that leafless silence, wandering off the path up under the plane trees, to watch and wait for the jogger to come around to a more reasoned, cautious point of view, and take my number and ask about your shots, and later let me know his elbow healed. Where each leaf clung, a scar. You knew you'd done wrong. The squirrels I'd kept you from until you leaped to vent frustration on what came in reach. We now ignored all wild wrung out of us. Defeat felt almost like victory, peace. For once I wasn't aware of the baby, whether he slept still or was wide-eyed watchful. The weight I walked with like another child. So I won't give everything away from the narrative, um, but I'll read two more poems from the last section of the book. Um, and, and then that'll be it until the end. Fetch, muse, bring me back what I rejected. Let me stay stationary as the sun at either solstice while you do the work of memory, dropping life at my feet. The hardest part, relinquishing your hold without worrying what you carry dead. Learning to love the shuttle back and forth for the canvas weave it tightens with each turn. Fetching, a Janus word used of a boat, plying a course or veering, of in-breath or sigh. Fetch a measure of how far the wind blows, how, how far waves scud ahead without interruption, swelling until they stumble upon shore. Your fetch as long as your leash pulls you up. And then the last poem for now, dream sequence. After writing you last night, I had a dream our dog had died and then the thread unraveled and I had you back again, although you'd grown, so that on your hind legs you loomed over me, bear-like as I hugged your barrel chest, your fur groomed full in soft curls, a long embrace of nothing I deserved. Andy's stand-in, his hair a swatch of yours before it turned. Then at the back of the refrigerator, I found a chicken drumstick, half ravened, left from the time my mom hand-fed her dog, plain meat, honey, anything so he'd eat. And I wondered if it was still good weeks later and who might have a dog I could give it to. But everyone I knew had lost their dog, although the dream didn't put it that way. 
just left me turning absent images. Still, the feeling I woke to was of love, holding you magnified by your return, sturdy and secure as a temple column into which all blind Samson's strength was poured. Today, I passed a Norman Rockwell scene, a leashed puppy dragging children through a yard to cross the street and greet a woman's beagle, the older girl stooping to pet him, adoring, crooning. He looks just like our old dog, Bailey. The older woman nodding with approval. We remember all our dogs, all of them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was so moving and lovely. Um, we will hear another poem from Rebecca after the Q&A. Um, but for now, I will be happy to introduce Len, um, who will also read for about 15 minutes. And to introduce you to those who don't know him, Len Kresak's most recent books are Say What You Will, which is original poems, and The Aeneid, Aeneid a complete verse translation of Virgil's epic. Len's latest books are After, After Image, The Carmina of Catullus, and Ovid's erotic poems. His work appears in the Hudson, Swanee, PN, and Antioch Reviews, and he is the recipient of the Robert Penn Warren, Richard Wilbur, and Robert Frost Prizes. He's also a four-time champion on Jeopardy. Welcome, Len. Thank you. Um, I want to thank Deirdre and Rebecca and Karina and especially Alex Peppel and Able Muse Press. I'm sorry I had to turn the, the light on here, but I'm going to read from the book and it's the only way I can do this. So my apologies if that kind of uh, creates problems. I'd like to start with something autobiographical. I don't really write poetry, I write poems. And they uh, are often separate and hermetically sealed from one another. For autobiography, I'm from Michigan, Battle Creek. And this is called Lower Peninsula. Asked where I'm from, I say Michigan made me and touch the birthmark below the lifeline of my right hand. Just here, under the locked knuckles of the half opened, half cupped fist, a stiff mitten the map won't fit. Just here, down at the heel of the Indian how, a little above and slightly ahead of the place where the thickened wrist cuts and twists west. And though the nuns said thumbs up in school, I went ahead without a hitch and have only to put my finger on it to keep my place. Born with my life in the palm of my hand, I'll try not to say too much in between some of these poems. Um, we just passed Halloween and a few years ago, I saw some really strange Halloween decorations, uh, something about the Northeast or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania or whatever tends to have these displays. This is called Sentenced and it is about a Halloween yard decoration, just to give you some grounding and some context. The bones have taken up a loafer slouch, lines sprouting from the joints in graceful arcs that mock the way a corkscrew willow weeps. They lead to batteries that seem to vouch for someone's bona fides. Nothing sparks though. This guignol will give no soul the creeps. No corpse will die when someone throws the switch. The tin man skull caps blossomed into wires. Wags have warned us with a thousand volts. Will any of this scare some shrunken witch tonight? Will any children fear the fires threatened? No one pauses, no one bolts. All night the skeleton prepares to fry, to frighten small fry with his will to die. He sits and waits in his electric chair the porch lights flicker on, knock, knock, who's there? So much for comedy. 
Uh, this is a poem, only six lines are, yeah, six lines long, written mostly, believe it or not, just for the sound. And yet I, I obviously have an interest in classics. So Ulysses, I think we all know the story. So for 10 years, locust suitors were his foemen while monster round eye raged to know his no men and killer wit Odysseus answered, no man. Then like that pious one, the founding Roman, he spurned his didos at a goddess omen and cleansed his home with blood, blood's perfect bowman. Um, what should I say, 16? I mentioned an interest in the classics. This is called after Callimachus, a um, Greek poet around 280 BC. And he mentions someone in here named um, Heraclitus. I caution you, it's not the philosopher Heraclitus, just in case there's any confusion. Very famous poem from uh, the classics. When someone Heraclitus told me you were dead, I wept to think how once we talked the sun to bed. Long, long ago, I fear your life came to an end and you are ashes now, my Halicarnassian friend. But all your nightingales are living, singing still, and Hades has not grasped them and he never will. I'm not entirely sure if it's clear there, but Heraclitus uh, in this case is a poet and the nightingales are his poems. They will go on living. Um, more in a classics vein. Pardon me while I thumb through here. I'm sure we all know that the first three or four or five um, emperors were not particularly uh, laudable characters. This is called Tiberius and it deals with a, a well-known anecdote out of Plutarch. There won't be conquests anymore. Time saw to that. Now comes withdrawal. There's not the slightest chance that war will rouse the appetite at all. Faint images will have to do. Ghosting memories, blue cave wall. Bound fast, this is the last Capri that isolation offers you. Excite yourself with fantasy if memory fails. Below, old goat, the grotto. Up above, caprice. Your vices have you by the throat. Your organs rot now piece by piece. Waves wash the cave and never cease. I think uh, he became an aficionado of pornography before he died. Um, how about something biblical instead? Ah, uh, yes. I mentioned earlier to, was it to Karina? About um, Rocky Ruggiero and uh, Italian Renaissance art. Um, we've seen so many Davids. I mean, there are five or six famous ones, the statues and obviously Michelangelo and Donatello and so forth. But I've noticed in looking at them that it seems like the stone is often one stone, even in Bernini's, I'm not quite sure, there's no way to tell really. But if you go back and read the biblical story of David and Goliath that we think we all know so well, you discover that, well, you discover this poem, percentages. He was so certain, says the book, that when the day was done, the giant wouldn't be alive, why was it then that what he took to fight with was not a single stone, but rather five? The title percentage is my little joke, uh, playing it safe if you're David. Why take the risk that only one stone will do? Um, something a little more personal and modern and up to date. This is about an elderly woman who um, is no longer with us. She wanted to save the world by recycling. It's called salvage. 
Oh, I should mention mules. Does everybody know what mules are? Not yet. The slippers that women used to wear, you know. Okay, salvage. Robed, muled, and hovering curbside over barrel and bin. What must she think to find so much with useful life still in it? Fingers peck and flutter, fidget, snatch. The globe in peril every minute cries for rescue. Such a waste. Save, rinse, reuse, repeat. Else dreck will drown us. What possessed that spendthrift daughter of hers insisting this was hoarding? Earth, the frail green earth needs ever greener care. Surely that was the baby with the water in the barrel bottom bawling there. Burdened with what has clearly proved its worth throughout the years, she scuffs back up the drive, stubbornly cradling all that must survive. Let's see. Another elderly lady, uh, it should become apparent who she was. This is called Grave. While sparse November leaves leave limbs half flocked, earth eats the burden of her dust, a mouth in which the urn of ash is pocketed. So taught I pocket too the folded check that notes how much half of her life was worth, half his as well, her mate much put upon, six years now that my father has been gone. She left a dirt floor schoolhouse barefoot south, left there a black sheep brother half redneck. She'd plotted from the day she'd given birth, but never planned this gift her going gave. Ghiberti's doors and Canaletto's views await the sextons shoveling in the grave, and it only remains to book the cruise. And I think I'll stop with, how am I doing? Did I overrun my time? Just one more. And then we'll open up for questions and answers. Uh, sorry for the recondite reference, but does anyone remember Louise Brooks, the silent film star? See heads not, no? <laughs> okay. She was a, um, a powerful silent film star uh, and was generally thought by a lot of people to be uh, more beautiful than Greta Garbo, which I kind of get behind that opinion myself. And uh, she played uh, Pandora, Lulu, the opera by Barry. Poem for Louise Brooks. Lulu opens up her box. Dread scatters everywhere in flocks. Deadly troubles take off, flying, and people everywhere start dying. Louise puts on her bowl of black, a helmet forged from perfect bangs. Her smile is staked with gleaming fangs. Men go for her, but don't come back. Weimar Pandora, jazz age vamp, you sowed the sins of suicide and murder till you found your hide, your ripper in the London swamp. Yes, you were beautiful, a face not even perfect Garbo had. Louise, good God, but you were bad. No one will ever take your place. Thank you. Yes, I should. Um... Thank you so much, Len. Another beautiful reading. Um, I think we have a lot to digest but I suspect that folks may have questions. Uh, so you can either just unmute yourself and jump in, or okay. you can ask a question in the chat. And I will keep an eye out on the chat. Hi, Anton. An old friend. Nice. Hey, Lynn. Yes. Hey, it's uh, Mark Dawson. Greetings from uh, DC. Enjoyed the reading of both of you. Thank you. It's good to see you. 
well. Here's Thanks. Something. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm ignoring a Georgia-Tennessee football game to uh, attend this reading. <laughs> so uh, that tells you uh, uh, <laughs> what esteem that's, I hold this work in. Um, uh, that's noble of you, yes. <laughs> um, hey, I just wanted to ask you, uh, I noticed uh, in your book uh, there were, you know, two or three poems about elderly persons or uh, persons uh, perhaps confused. And um, I, yeah, I find in a lot of writers uh, moving poems um, that arise from that from that uh, trigger, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, I think if, there's a poem in Andrew Hudgens' first book about, uh, I think it's Grandmother, uh, one by Chase Twitchell called Poem for Your 80th. Uh, I just wondered if uh, if you had any comment at all about uh, favorite poems about, uh, you know, persons who are older and maybe what, uh, what, what compels us to, as writers, to often go to that topic. I don't know how to answer except to say that I found in each of those cases the the personal connection very moving, and that's why I was brought to write about them. As far as a favorite poem about an older person, maybe Frost, an old man, a winter night. No. Right. Thanks. Okay. Nice to hear from you. Thank you. I have a question for Rebecca. <laughs> was that your first, second, uh, third dog? Or am I prying there? Oh, that was our first dog. First dog. Yeah, I mean, we had had, I had had a childhood dog for a, a few years, a stray dog that we'd kind of adopted, but um, but was hit by a car. It was, that was a sad experience too. And um, and my husband had, had volunteered at shelters but otherwise, we really didn't know dogs very well. So it was definitely a learning experience. For very us. Ten tender poem. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have two. Uh, we have two dogs now. They're going with, so far so good. <laughs> so happier ending. I have a question, Rebecca, as well. I I believe you said you had about two hundred and fifty sonnets. Is that what you said? Okay. So mind blown. Um, but also, how did you winnow the manuscript? Um, that's, that's a lot of editing. And I'm just curious yeah. about the process and how painful it was or was not. It wasn't painful because it took so long. I think that's why it took so long. So what first happened is we'd kind of moved sort of abruptly. We left Portland and came to Vermont. We had two young children and this had happened. I just felt like I'd never had time to process anything. And so it all just kind of came out like I would I remember sitting on the bathroom floor so that I, with the door closed so I didn't disturb the kids who'd be sleeping in their apartment at the time. And um, so then by, once time passed, it was clear that a lot of that didn't have, people didn't need to know all those details to have the emotional connection with the work. So, I mean, partly at some point I was showing other people and getting feedback. Um, and then partly it was just seeing where the energy still was and what could easily go and just didn't need to bridge it over. And then I realized I really had to focus on those sections that I kept because I hadn't been looking at them as standalone poems. And so it, it was hard to turn something that's you know sort of a bridge between, from one thing to another into something that stands alone. But yeah, it was a Thank long process. <laughs> Thank you. I could ask Len a question in turn. You said that your poems tend to be hermetically sealed a little, or they they come to you individually. And yeah. I'm wondering how you how do you then create the, your collections out of that? Well, it's pretty straightforward. I just take what I think are the ones I like the best, maybe 50, 60 pages, and send it in. That's it. In terms um, of, do you order them chronologically or you, you uh, just- No, I see what you're saying, yeah. I used to try to do that. The first book I ever did for the uh, University of Evansville for the Wilbur thing was, I tried to put the poems in sections and give them little titles, you know, like section one, five, that sort of thing. And eventually I just kind of gave up on that. I just put the poems in alphabetically unless I could see a real strong connection. And I was, led to do that because of something that uh, Richard Wilbur once told me. He said, I don't really write poetry, I write poems. I said, well, I'm going to steal that line in the future. Um, there may be no connection between a poem about an elderly woman who saves everything from the trash can 
and um, Tiberius. I don't know. I just pull those two at random. Um, I, I tend to look at things and see metaphor and hear first lines and hear phrases. And at some point, those start to coalesce and I have to write it. It's like redeeming everyday experience. You see it, you kind of got to grab it and give it something. Sorry, I'm going on gassing here. Yeah, that's great. I have a question for Lynn. Uh, you're an exceptionally good and prolific translator. And I wonder if you could favor us with a translation, a, a small translation, perhaps one of your Ovid pieces. Uh, you know, I could I could do that, but I'm going to have to get up and go grab a book off the shelf and so forth. Maybe I could. May, I didn't plan on doing that as my last one, but um, <laughs> I, I'm not trying to, to put you off. Oh, that's okay. It's whatever, whatever. It's going to take some time and, and so forth. But please forgive me on that. It's very kind of you to say that. And by the way, your Valerie book, hmm. I've been ordering that, and it still hasn't come in. It's very hard to get. I know. I, I apologize. Uh, well, thank you. That was kind. I see we the have. A oh, I'm sorry. No, no. I see we have a question in the chat from Anton. Um, now that these new books are out in the world and you're performing the poems publicly, is there anything new you're discovering about your poems? Any you any any uh, way that you're seeing them in a new way or experiencing some of them differently? And that's for either or both of you. Yeah, Rebecca. Um, well, I got to do a like a book group uh, with the poem with um, a handful of folks, and then I think also sending hearing feedback from people. There are certain poems that affect people that I didn't necessarily know would feel like the core emotion of the of the book for them, or um, so I think that helped clarify for me um, where where that was, and that. Um, like in the, the last poem I read, Dream Sequence, that idea that everyone I knew had lost their dog, um, that feeling of that it was like losing your way or losing th this bigger sense of, of what was lost and that was a common thing for everyone that, I don't know, it opened up something for me too, to realize, to he just to hear that kind of feedback from people. Thank you. Lynn, how about you? Um. Cue me in again. How how were you phrasing the question? And my mind has been drifting off. I'm so sorry. Now now that now that these books are out in the world and you're performing the poems yeah. publicly, is uh, there yeah. anything new? Is there anything new you're discovering about your poems? Are you seeing any of them in a new way or experiencing some of them different? N nothing except that they may be prone to my incipient and um, Alzheimer's or something going on there. A senior moment. Um, you know, uh, straightforward on it. No, not really. I wish I could say something witty or clever about it, but I can't. Uh, when you read, as you know, all of you read to live audiences. Um, somebody started this question a long time ago, Karina. Um, yeah, it's different, of course. You get to see their, not just their faces, but you can read the, the temperature of the room and the response. If somebody rolls his eyes, that's one thing. We're all used to that from students. But um, you can kind of tell from body language and the fidgeting whether or not someone is really unhappy with what you've done. So most of my poems I, I finish reading, and it's very much like Zoom because, I mean, when I'm doing an in-person reading, because when I finish each poem, there's deadly silence. And one has to fill it with something, you know, introduce the next poem. There's much a good question, though. There's a lot to think about, and I think the silence is uh, frequently indicative of the fact that there's, you know, one has a lot to process. And yeah, yeah. thank you for, you know, thanks to both of you. I, I you know, both of your readings are amazing. Uh, really thank amazing. you. I think it's quite true what you say. There's often too much to absorb in a reading, and you want the text in front of you, or you want to be able to read it afterwards and say, ah, oh my gosh, that was a sonnet or whatever, you know, you're, you're quite right there, I think. John, do you have a question? <clears throat> Len and Esrik, by the way, the way, both readings were excellent. I much enjoyed them. Um, <clears throat> at the end of your Halloween poem, uh, you went knock, knock, and then said so much for comedy. <laughs> 
when there was <laughs> silence. <laughs> and I just thought that was a good example of the difference between reading. That's, a, that's exactly Zoom what I was talking about. Zoom and live audience. And uh, it, is that an impediment, do you think? Or do you think you can just do humor on Zoom, hear the silence, and assume that everyone found it funny anyway? <laughs> well, I would say it, it's for both. You're going to get silence in each case. You know, uh-oh, that wasn't taken as funny at all. And then you're you're stuck you know there's nothing you can do about it at that point and that's what the emojis are for also right <laughs> so, thumbs up yes i should have used emojis i had myself on mute i want I, I would have had more reactions but i'm on mute there was like massive thunder going on outside and a loud repairman in the other room so i put myself on mute, but tried to facially react <laughs> not so good with emojis Thank you. Um, I see Ellen Kaufman also wrote in that she laughed. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen. Uh, may I ask a, a question uh, um, of both readers? And thank you so much for, for the wonderful readings. Um, it's interesting that, um, Rebecca, your, your collection is very thematically focused since your, your title is a clever reflection on that. And Len, it's interesting how you're saying that, that um, you write poems, not poetry. So my question for both of you is um, about selecting a title because for my first manuscript, um, it, I feel like it was easy to select a title because everything was very, it was a kind of an, it's kind of a narrative book. Um, and, and so the title definitely came to me and the title made sense thematically. But now for manuscript two, I'm finding, um, oh, there, there are poems here and there, and I don't know if I want to do something more thematic, but if I choose to not go a thematic route, what advice do both of you have in terms of how do you come up with a title that somehow fits as kind of an, the, a title that you love, but also fits as an umbrella for all the work? I mean, I can just say quickly that I've had help picking both my titles out. You know, they're both from a phrase in, that occurred in the book, but someone else had to identify them. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that sometimes it's hard to see your own work in the same way someone else can see it. Ah. So, so you're saying solicit feed a lot of feedback from other well, not, people. Well, not you just have to find one person. One person. <laughs> the, the one right person who has the answer, or you know. I don't know, Len may have a better suggestion. I find titles hard. Is Len frozen? I think he might, I think he yeah. might be frozen. Len. Somebody said in the chat that, um, that they liked that one line of Rebecca's, what was it? A line of Rebecca's that really struck me was what cannot be learned when taught with love. And I've noticed in all of Rebecca's work that there's always that line that just reaches right out and grabs you. And, you know, not in any kind of assaultive way, but just really simple language and yet so powerful. And you can just feel your whole face, your whole self just, whoa you know, that it really touches you, you really get it. And I just think that's such a gift. Thank you, Margaret. It's nice to hear. Are we hoping Len gets back on? I think we are hoping. Here I am. Oh. Yeah, oh. My, my whole system just went mute for a while there. Oh, okay. Okay, uh, about the title though, could I say something? Yes, please do. Um, I know, at one point, Auden, I can't remember which book it is, uh, one of Auden's, uh, he just listed all the poems alphabetically. I mean, they just were put out that way. It was only after I had put these together in the book, Say What You Will, that I realized I had chosen the title to mean three different things, and they seemed to cover everything. There was Say What You Will, you know, speak out, don't be afraid to say what's on your mind. But the, the other meaning of Say What You Will, which is uh, no matter what you say, I, this is the case. And then a third meaning that occurred to me later, which was say what you wish, say what you want, express your desires. And all three of those were covered by the title. So I fell in love with the title. 
That's good. Great advice. Thank you. Thank you. And I noticed that Alicia Stallings book, Like, also is in alphabetical order. And, and then yeah. with that one word title, I mean, it's such a short title. And then I forget how far I went into the book I was before I realized, wow, these are all in alphabetical order. Like how liberating what must that have been, you know, because I can remember agonizing over like sorting the order. I'm thinking, and it's, yeah, it works super well. It's definitely easier. <laughs> That's a tremendous book, by the way, if I can put uh -huh. in a plug for Alicia Stallings like. Um, I hadn't noticed that. Oh, it's an amazing book uh, that she could take that word that's become such a disaster in our <laughs> grammatical culture, or whatever you want to call it, and do an entire book that plays with it. And she has a long, long poem about people using the word like. But it's a, it's a fine book. I'm a big fan of hers. Yeah, I was saying I did. I never noticed that they were alphabetical. The poems in that. That's great. I have a question for Rebecca. Yes. <laughs> Rebecca, uh, I some of your students were pre-ordering your books, and they seem to be very excited about uh, you know getting it as quickly as possible. And uh, I got lots of uh, feedback from them about how much they liked it. So I just wanted to know if they came back to you about their reactions to the book once uh, they had it in their hands. And also, did you get any other new, you know, feeling or in any kind of uh, realization from what they told you after they you know, received the book? Yeah, I mean, they were some of some of them were in when it, some of them were here. Um, and then some were in the um, in the book group that I did through something called ESI College. And um, and it was really interesting, you know, at first people had everyone, a lot of people have this kind of story, I think. So they relate to it through the story of having to give up an animal that they love and are bonded to, or just, or if even not an animal, sometimes it's it's another relationship in life that, that it just was touched by, by some of the, poems or the emotion in it. Um, and yes, I did hear I did hear from them also that they had wonderful exchanges with you. Um, and where you know, that just how nice you were to send them a PDF ahead of time or whatever if they needed it. So thank you for that. Yeah. But yeah, they've been um, a very big support group for me. So <laughs> I really appreciated them. Are there other questions? And also I'll have a question for Len. <laughs> yeah. So Len, I noticed that most of your books are very short, like 60 poems or less, you know, somewhere around there. Is mm -hmm. there a particular reason why you, you, I know some people have books that are twice as long as that. Yeah. So can you give us some, you know, rationale for how well, you decide how long your books should be? Well, I could say two things about that. One, I try to winnow it down to the poems I like the best and it seemed the best to me. There are tons of poems I published that don't make it into the books. And uh, I don't want to dilute the product, so to speak. And if you want a longer book, Alex, um, I recommend you buy 50 or 60 copies of my Aeneid. That's uh, 9,000 lines. It'll keep you occupied. <laughs> Thanks for the advice, Len. <laughs> I'm also right now in the middle of translating Petrarch's uh, Remus Barsa, which is 366 poems, mostly sonnets, and it's taken two and a half years so far, and I'm only about 73% of the way through. By the time it finishes, it'll be 400 pages. Wow. <laughs> I'll send you a copy. Find the club. Listen, will be 90 years <laughs> old. Some, something similar. Oh, let's hope not. <laughs> I'm already 89. I mean, no, I'm just joking. Oh my gosh. Shoot. There's some very shy poets here who don't want to ask questions. We're Did all anyone poets. Know? I'm a, a non-poet. I have a question for Rebecca. Um, I, I, I love that you wrote a whole book about your relationship with a dog, which is very you know it's a very accessible topic and of course it's about so much more than the 
um, your dog, but about love and loss and life and <laughs> children and the whole. I'm, I'm curious, did you set out with, in mind to, to write a whole book of poems about, about your relationship with that dog? Or how did you come to, be, to do that? Or did you, yeah, did you just start with, what was your starting point in getting into doing that? Yeah, I, it's hard. It's, it was 10 years ago. I, do, I definitely know that. And it's hard for me to remember what I was thinking when I sat down. But um, I definitely started with Hear Muse. And so there's this sense of like, this was an epic about a dog, right? You're comparing, you know, very small things in this high language. And somehow it tapped into like that idea of appealing to a muse, which is like your way to tap into memory. It just kind of pulled out the story. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't remember why I decided to do it or why I wrote in these fourteen line segments that were narrative. It was, it was a strange, a strange decision, but I, I just, it just kept pulling more out in some way. So, but I can't say more than that. Really, it just, it just started to happen. But it wasn't. I didn't consciously set out to do it. Um, that I remember. Yeah, thanks for that question. And then did you set them aside for a long time? Or did you sort of come and go from them? Or how how did, you know, from your start in Oregon to having this book in our hands now, what did that journey look like? It was a long journey. I mean, I took the start of it to the first time I went to the Burlington Writers Workshop in Vermont, which you may be familiar with. And, um, so then it helped actually workshop it some. And then I ended up finding poet Karen Gottschall looked at it early on and she um, helped me with it. it did, I think she was maybe the first to kind of get me to trim it. And then, um, I don't know, it just, it kind of went from there. But I definitely, I wrote another book in that time. Um, the one, so, that really was later, like my first book really came after this, this first draft, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, and I've written a book of short stories that I'm working on, you know, there's a lot of things that came in between, but I think time helped me have some perspective on it. If there are more questions, how about if I ask one, and then we'll, um, we'll hear the closing poems from each poet. But this is one, you know, again, for either or both of you, and maybe we're so used to the pandemic now that we don't ask about it. But I am curious if you think that the pandemic has affected you as a poet or has affected your poetry and whether those are separable, I don't know. But I am curious if there are ways that you think um, you feel that, you feel a difference. Rebecca? Oh, um, I found that, I mean, when the pandemic started, that was the hardest time I'd ever had for writing. I found it very hard to think in terms of poetry at that time. So definitely, plus just everything ended, kids were home. Um, it, I think I remember feeling the world got so small, like there was no, ex, there was no other space. It was all the same space. So I didn't have that. I didn't have a room of my own or just like a mental space of my own. Um, so it's taken a while to have that again, but you know now things have normalized now more. Um, and and I don't think, except for that sense of you know even just how small the poetry world is, that we can connect with people and hear poets from all over the country. I don't know if I've processed what that change means, but there is a different feeling in some way that there is this kind of unified audience almost of poets that I didn't have a sense of before. I, I would definitely that. say there's been a strong effect. Um, there was a time a few years ago when I might publish 20, 30, 40 poems a year in magazines. And this past year, I think I've managed to land five, which tells me that editors have been just stopped dead cold. Um, I am poems in the poetry magazine, for example, have been sitting there for 17 months. So you just get fewer acceptances and less publishing. It's it's really hit the editors and the staffs and the magazines. Yeah, so much slowdown. 
I've been noticing a few, people? like magazines closing, you know, that were mm -hmm. really beloved magazines too. So hopefully that doesn't happen to too many of them. They'll never die, Rebecca. There must be 1,700 of them right now in poets <laughs> and writers. <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have one last question before we hear um, closing poems? All right. Well, um, Rebecca. Sure, I will read. So if it's still in that document, if you didn't read ahead, it's the last poem in the Google Doc. Um, Tempo rubato, that's a musical term for stolen time, um, where you can kind of steal time from one measure and use it in the next. So that's the metaphor of the poem. This, the book has two cameos from our current dog, and this is do from our current um, dogs, and this is one of them from our dog named Walter. <laughs> a few of you know. Tempo rubato. Sometimes on our loop of seeking and reward, I'll look back to find the dog, head askew, gripping a bone still raw with life. Today, it's a pelvic wing scored from the ribs and spine, picked clean in the oxbow, that he lopes ahead far enough to flop down and crowbar his jaw with until I draw even. Each time I pass, he heaves himself up with a reluctance he can't hide. Not from me, lugging my own bone to tear life's spark, stealing a beat so I can lag to gnaw down to the marrow until something crashes past, kicking up its high white flag. And after the chase, I can't remember why. I feel light listening to the whistling sparrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lynn. Okay. Uh, Jan, I will try to send you an email of a, an Ovid translation. I apologize. Oh, okay. That was kind of awkward and clumsy. Um, I'm a real, as you might be able to tell, old movie fanatic. And uh, something that bothers me about even great movies, classics, is how many microphones, boom shadows you see in the walls in a, in a shot. I turned this into a lifelong search. This is called continuity and continuity is usually assigned to somebody on the set who has to make sure that if the clock says 504 in one scene, it says 505 a few minutes later and so forth. It's called continuity. Mistakes. How can I tell you what they've meant to me? For years, I've tracked down shadows, even in the films of French auteurs. They've lent my life its meaning, all that I believe in. Not shadows only either. Clocks mismatched from frame to frame proclaimed that the times weren't right, while props attached came somehow unattached in later takes, white turned to black, black, white. Still, errant shadows were my special love. And when one spoiled some shot, then I was in a kind of seventh heaven, high above the cameraman detected by his sin. The ecstasy of things that could go wrong nourished and sustained me through the years, propping my spirits up my whole life long. How strange that failure comforts, warms, and cheers. Left to myself, I summon shots still rife with even great directors' careless blunders. It's lent a special meaning to my life, savoring error. I revel in its wonders. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful reading. Thank you again so much, Rebecca and Len, as well as Alex and Karina for setting this up and giving us this opportunity to come together on a um, cool and gray Saturday, at least where I am, and um, be inspired by so many wonderful poems. So please join me in, you can unmute yourself, I don't know. Terrific, absolutely terrific. Thank you to everybody, everybody who came, everybody, Alex, Deidre, Rebecca, everyone, yes. Karina. Likewise, thank you, Deirdre, for hosting. Thank you. Wonderful reading, both of you, loved it. Terrific. Pleasure. Absolutely Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
So I encourage you all to go to the press's website to get the readers' books tonight. Uh, I'll say uh, Rebecca's book, Fetch Muse and Lens, say what you will. So the press's website is easy. It's ablemusepress.com. And also register for our newsletters at ablemuse.com. I'm going to have those links in the chat box so you can, I'll do that right now. So thank you all for coming and I'll hope to see you next month for another reading from some of our talented poets. Buy hundreds of copies, never too soon to start thinking about those <laughs> holiday gifts. Lord <laughs> Able Muse. Thank you. Thank you all. See you Have next time. Weekend. Thanks. You too.